relates to current uh, tier, uh, priority group 1B, tier 1, I should say, uh, the vaccination uh, priority groupings that, that we've created to date. Uh, but we'll make some changes to uh, 1B, tier 1, that will go into effect on Monday, February the 8th. Specifically, uh, as I have um, indicated we were likely to do, we're going to be lowering the eligible age for receiving the vaccine from 70 to 65. We will also add a few other smaller groups, including some election staff for the March and April elections, some members of the Unified Command Group and state COVID-19 uh, responders, and some local emergency response personnel as well. And you can see that from the graphic that's being presented. As you will recall, the initial guidance from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that was adopted by the CDC um, asked us to start with a priority that included age 75 and above. At the beginning of January, however, when we got to that particular group, we in Louisiana went to age 70 uh, and above. And that was because our data in Louisiana showed that that was really the line of demarcation. And as people were 70 and older, uh, their chances of having a very serious outcome, uh, poor outcome with, with COVID-19 uh, requiring either hospitalization on the one hand or, hand or resulting in death on the other was significantly higher. We have always said that we would make every effort to follow the federal recommendations while also making whatever adjustments were necessary to take into account what was happening here in Louisiana uh, with the greatest emphasis on preserving hospital capacity and saving lives. That is why we started at 70 instead of 75. Uh, towards the very end of the Trump administration, I want to say that it may have been the, the week the last week, uh, the CDC changed the recommendation to include those 65 uh, and older. That recommendation has been maintained by the current White House under the Biden administration and the current CDC as well. Because uh, supply of the vaccine doses to our state has also increased, uh, I feel much more comfortable about going down to age 65 uh, and above, and we've already had several weeks where individuals who were 70 and above were, were uh, able to, to make appointments if, if, if they could get through. And we, we do know and are well aware that to this point, demand for the vaccine doses has exceeded supply. Uh, going to age 65 and above, I believe is in line with what about 29 other states are doing including, uh, I believe, most of the states in our region. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it is also consistent with our rationale for prioritization since the beginning, because we know that people over 65 are much more likely to die from COVID than those who are younger. And in fact, data from the CDC shows that people 65 to 74 are five times more likely to be hospitalized if they contract COVID-19. And uh, they are 90 times more likely to die. Uh, and, and this is relative to individuals who are in the 18 to 29 age group. Lowering the age to 65 will add about 250,000 people uh, to priority 1B tier one. Uh, we know that not all 250,000 are likely to sign up to take it, although we hope they would, that would be a great uh, outcome. But uptake is never 100%. Um, and let me reiterate that this expanded eligibility goes into effect on Monday, February the 8th. So not today, not tomorrow, not Saturday, not Sunday, but on Monday. Additionally, and as mentioned earlier, we're adding some election staff ahead of the March and April elections, uh, some unified command group uh, members, uh, state COVID-19 responders, and some local emergency response personnel. Uh, last week, we also added the American Sign Language interpreters and support service providers because as you can see when they work they can't wear a mask um, and they're working in community and clinic-based settings um, and with clients who are both deaf and blind 
We have also opened it up to all law enforcement and first responders, whereas initially it was limited to those who would be administering vaccines and rendering health care, uh, for example, in jails and, and so forth. In total, including the 250,000 or so in the age group of 65 to 69, it's about 275,000 additional people that we'll be adding uh, to the uh, priority group whose eligibility starts on Monday. Uh, this is important. Uh, we are not only just managing the current COVID, uh, COVID caseload, we're also concerned about a fourth surge that could be driven by the new variants, um, particularly uh, the B117 variant, the UK variant, which is present now in 35 or more states uh, and in multiple communities here in Louisiana. We know that it's at least 50% uh, more transmissible, and I believe that the most recent data uh, suggests that this variant can produce more serious outcomes uh, as well. So it is important uh, to get as many people in the highest priority groups vaccinated as soon as we possibly can. It's also important for emergency response leadership to be well uh, so that they can help us to manage the crisis. Uh, and yes, because I've, I've received this question a number of times up to now, uh, I am part of the Unified Command Group. And so I will be receiving my first dose of vaccine next week, and we'll let you know more about when and where that will happen. Essential workers in the priority one, oh, by the way, I'm pretty excited about being able to do that. I'm looking forward to it. Essential workers in the priority 1B tier group, uh, I'm sorry, tier two group are next in line for their COVID vaccines. Uh, and can't tell you today when that's gonna happen. Uh, we don't know when uh, Pfizer doses and Moderna doses are going to increase again. We don't know yet when the next vaccine may come online, potentially the Johnson and Johnson single dose vaccine. Um, we know how important it is for these individuals too to be vaccinated. Um, and it's, it's important for everybody to be vaccinated and we put them into the priority where they are because we, we know that it's important. Uh, and in that context, I know there's a lot of uh, discussion around schools and making sure that they can remain open for in-person instruction. Um, and I did want to take a moment uh, to thank our teachers for the incredible work that they have been doing. Uh, and uh, they are in that uh, next order of priority when we can get to it. Um, but our schools in Louisiana, uh, for the most part, have been open for in-person instruction uh, going back to Labor Day. Uh, and so that's a testament uh, to, to their commitment. And we also know, and the CDC has recently confirmed this, that the school setting, uh, when the mitigation measures are properly adhered to, is principally around masking and distancing, which requires less density uh, in the school building uh, with respect to, to the number of students there, uh, staying home when you're sick and that sort of thing, uh, that there's not uh, a lot of transmission that occurs in that setting, and, that's, and that is a good thing. But we do want to get our teachers uh, vaccinated uh, as soon as we can. They are in the next order of priority, and I think that reflects the, the fact that we all believe that the work that they do is essential. Right now, our hands uh, are tied uh, because of the amount of vaccine that we are receiving. Uh, the good news is, and I'm going to get to this in just a moment, it is increasing. It's increasing, however, slower uh, than we would like. Uh, and it remains the limiting factor in the number of people that we can get vaccinated uh, and how quickly we can vaccinate them. But we are making um, progress. As of today's update, more than 534,985 total doses have been administered. And we're right at 131,000 who've received both first and second doses. We obviously have a long way to go and a lot more work to do. But it is uh, exciting, having been managing this public health emergency now since I think March the 9th of 2020, uh, to see the development uh, and, and uh, the, uh, in terms of the vaccination program. Uh, and getting the majority of Louisianans vaccinated is incredibly important because this is how we are finally going to put this pandemic behind us. We do want to remind everyone that it's going to be a 
long process. It's going to be measured in months, not days or weeks. Uh, but there is good news in that the federal government has again notified us, uh, I think it happened on Monday of this week, that starting next week there will be an increase in the doses that we receive by 5%. That 5% increase will come from Moderna uh, uh, vaccine doses. And the other thing is we have a little more clarification on the three weeks of visibility that we're going to have so that our opportunity to order, plan, communicate, coordinate with all these providers will not be limited to just two or three days the way it has been up to now. And so that should, that should make things much smoother and allow us to, to better plan and, and uh, schedule things and then make sure that, uh, that individuals in the community know when they are eligible uh, for getting the vaccine, but also know how and when to contact the, which provider so that they can actually receive the appointment to get it. Something else that we're very excited about uh, is that Louisiana will participate in the federal retail pharmacy program. You heard this announcement come out of Washington this week. Uh, it's going to increase our vaccine distribution. Uh, initially, it'll be 56 Walmart pharmacies statewide. Um, and that program formally begins on February the 11th. And when that program begins, the doses that they receive, which we believe will be around 14,000 per week, will not come out of our allocation. So we're excited about that. We're actually going to have these stores, 56, 50, um, 57, 57 uh, Walmarts, uh, next week uh, receive doses that we are going to allocate them so that they can all get started and test their systems with a with a smaller number of doses uh, and and so we're excited about that as as well now we're allocating those 5700 doses uh, to the stores next week out of what would have otherwise gone to the long-term care partnership uh, with Walgreens and CVS because these doses weren't needed for them to meet their scheduled vaccinations next week. In addition to those 5,700 doses that we're transferring uh, to these 57 Walmart stores, an additional 10,000 uh, doses were clawed back from the long-term care partnership program because they weren't going to be needed next week. And all together, next week we will have 408 enrolled providers and all 64 parishes administering 86,550 first doses. That's my math. If, if, if your math is different, you, you could tell them in a minute, Joe. But, um, and and I'll, I'll give you those numbers to let you know we are, we are making progress. It is slower than we would like, obviously, but we are making progress, and it requires an awful lot of work. And I want to thank everyone, uh, whether they are at the Department of Health and the Office of Public Health, they're the enrolled providers, which include hospitals and clinics and parish health units and pharmacies, both, both um, chain pharmacies and independent pharmacies. And we, our footprint is all over the state of Louisiana, and we're closing in on 2,000 enrolled providers. And for a state our size, that is just tremendous work that has been done and will allow us, as we receive more allocation of doses, to very quickly get those out. Uh, and into uh, people's arms. As I mentioned uh, the, for the first time a couple of weeks ago, uh, we have been looking into the, much more information around the individuals who are receiving uh, vaccinations, including uh, their age uh, and, and race. The race data was, was uh, not complete. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we were showing that 56% of the people being vaccinated in Louisiana, their race was either unknown or other, and obviously that was incorrect, and it prevents us from having a clear picture uh, of the, the folks who are receiving the vaccine. Uh, LDH uh, has begun to do the hard work necessary to clean that up, uh, and we've gotten that number down from 56% to about 35 to 36%, which means we still have work to, go, uh, to do, uh, but we know now from that 16 percent are showing up as african-american 47 percent uh as white uh and the the number of individuals in that 35 to 36 percent unknown or other is still uh you know 
much greater than it actually is. Uh, so the percentages of, of both African Americans and whites is, is higher uh, than we currently show it, but we don't know exactly how much higher. But we're going to continue to clean up the data that we already have for individuals who've been vaccinated and do a better job going forward of collecting that data on the front end. Uh, and I can tell you we have discovered this is a problem all over the country. Uh, and to tell you how much of a problem it is, I believe the 35 percent that we're showing as not knowing uh, the race of the individual being vaccinated is actually lower uh, than the national average. And that's not uh, not making an excuse. We're not happy with, with the information we have. We're going to continue to develop it. Today, we're reporting 2,758 cases of COVID-19 on 39,519 tests. We're also reporting 1,295 hospitalizations. That is down 91 from yesterday. Uh, and thankfully, it is down about 800 since January the 8th, when we went well above 2,000. We have 162 of those hospitalized patients on mechanical ventilators. Uh, that's down from 180 yesterday. Uh, very sadly, uh, we are reporting today 38 deaths from COVID-19. Yesterday, we marked the grim milestone of surpassing 9,000 COVID-19 deaths since the start of the pandemic here in Louisiana. As of today, that total is 9,044. And I want to give you a number that's really startling to me. Uh, over the last three weeks, we've had 1,000 COVID-19 deaths in Louisiana. And there is no doubt but that that surge in deaths are attributable to the increase in travel, to gatherings, and to activities related to the holidays. Um, and, and, and that is really sad. We can't fix what we did yesterday or what we didn't do yesterday, but going forward, we can all decide that is an unacceptable cost to bear, especially when this is largely preventable. And as we approach Super Bowl on Sunday, a time when traditionally there are lots of gatherings uh, with people indoors, um, and as we approach Mardi Gras, we should all be mindful uh, that gatherings, that travel, that activities, especially indoors, for prolonged periods of time, they cause more people to contract COVID. And when that happens, more people go to the hospital and more people die. Uh, we've seen it here, we've seen it all over the country. And, and I am asking everyone to double down and, and let's make a better effort individually and collectively to make sure that we don't have another surge. As you all know, deaths are, are a lagging indicator of the disease burden so that you can actually start showing improvements in your percent positivity, and we are. You can show improvements in the number of people in the hospital, no, I'm sorry, the number of cases that you're getting, and we are, and the number of people in the hospital, and we are, but those deaths are stubborn. Uh, and, and we're still uh, having way too many deaths each day. And in fact, nationwide, January was the deadliest month of the entire pandemic. Here in Louisiana, it was the second deadliest the, the month with the most deaths, most deaths was April of last year. And that was after Mardi Gras largely seeded the virus widely and deeply in the greater New Orleans area at a time we didn't even know it was happening. Well, shame on us if Mardi Gras 2021 looks anything like Mardi Gras 2020 with the number of people with COVID in our state and across the country this year. As I've just mentioned, our numbers have been improving relative to percent positivity cases and hospitalizations. But the baseline is still very, very high. I haven't asked Dr. Cantor what he's going to share with you today, but I think he's going to tell you that all 64 of our parishes remain red for having a high incidence of new cases relative to uh, population. That is more than 100 cases per 100,000 over seven days. 
So we still have a, a, a lot of COVID in Louisiana, too much COVID in Louisiana, and we have new variants out there. Um, and in fact, the UK variant is projected to potentially be the predominant strain of the coronavirus spreading in, by March. Okay, at this point, I'm going to ask Dr. Cantor to come up and share some information with you. I'll come back uh, in just a few minutes to close out and to take your questions. Uh, as we always do, if you've got questions for Dr. Cantor, please ask him while he's up here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your leadership throughout all of this. Um, just as the governor predicted, I'm, <laughs> I'll start off by, by reminding folks that COVID is, is widespread, continues to be widespread throughout the state of Louisiana. We uh, have some semblance of, of, of good news in that it's clear that we've peaked in terms of cases after the Christmas and New Year's holidays. And now for the past week or two, we've been slowly coming down the other side of that peak, but we're awfully high. We continue to have what's ranked by the CDC as the highest category of incidents, new cases. That's over 100 new cases per 100,000 residents over a seven day period. That's the case for all 64 parishes. That's the reason if you were to look at the map right now, as the governor mentioned, it's red throughout the entire state. Um, so the risk of community spread remains uh, exorbitantly high. The fatality counts, as the governor said, are <clears throat> a true lagging measure. And we continue to see increased fatality counts for a, a number of weeks after you peak and start coming down there. So we, we reached that grim milestone of 9,000 deaths yesterday. The past three weeks have been particularly costly to Louisiana, and so I think we should continue to expect to see those increased death counts for a couple more weeks lagging from the peak um, that we seem to be recovering from slowly right now. Um, there's still a, a lot of people hospitalized, even though that number is thankfully going in the right direction. And um, again, the risk of being exposed to COVID through normal daily activities in all 64 parishes is extremely high. It's been extremely high for the past four to six weeks. It remains extremely high now. And that's, that's, that's the most important message to convey as it has been the past few weeks that people need to take precautions. It's still very, very risky out there. I will um, I want to remind folks that uh, one of the tools we have is the uh, COVID Defense app, which is a uh, exposure notification tool. It's 100% free. You can get it from the iPhone app store. You can get it from the Android app store. No cost at all, completely confidential, completely anonymous. It's a really good way to know if you have been exposed to COVID just through daily activities or at your work site. You know, of course, it only works if both parties are using it. Um, we've had it out now for about a couple weeks. We've had over 30,000 downloads of it. I think it's going quite well. No one's obligated to use it. I don't want to give that impression. Um, it doesn't track no one's location. It just uses a, a Bluetooth radius of about six feet. But it, it is a tool, and as we still have high transmissibility, and as we look at what might be coming ahead, and I'll get to that in a second, um, I want people to avail themselves of everything that's out there. So I would encourage people, if you haven't done so yet, download the COVID Defense app. It's pretty easy to find, COVID Defense Louisiana, and it's easy to set up, and again, it doesn't cost anything to do it. To speak a little bit about uh, where we are with the vaccine, and, and I'll give you some, some numbers in a second. I think we're doing quite well, and as you compare us to other states, we continue to rank amongst the top category of states in terms of how much vaccine is administered as a per capita of how much we receive and a per capita of what our population is. So I'm very encouraged by that. I think you know we owe really all the credit to our vaccine providers across the state. And these are hospitals, these are clinics, these are pharmacies, and now some parish health units as well. They're really working hard. It's been challenging circumstances. Up until now, they've not gotten a lot of forewarning or time to prepare when they get doses allocated to them. Um, that'll change going forward, but it's, been, it's not been an easy task, and they really have stepped up in, in a big, big way, and that's why we're doing so well with the vaccine. We were thankful to receive a little bit more in our allocations for, for next week from Operation Warp Speed, and I'll kind of go over that right now. So at the conclusion of this week, 
after um, the amount that had been transferred over to the long-term care partnership program was taken into account, we will have, and this is just first doses, 411,850 doses available for in-state allocation. Next week, we are being allocated for Pfizer, 29,250 doses, and for Moderna, 41,600 doses, which is a small bump from the week prior for which we're thankful for. In addition to that, as the governor said, we will be doing two maneuvers. We'll be clawing back, so to say, or taking 10,000 doses that we had previously allocated to the long-term care partnership because we were required to by the CDC. They're now giving us allowance to, so to say, claw those back. So we'll be clawing those back and adding them to our in-state allocations and distributions. We are also going to be seeding, so to say, um, the retail pharmacy partnership program with Walmart with an additional 5,700 doses taken from that long-term care partnership program bank. All told, that's going to give us at the conclusion of next week, I'm, I'm, I'm projecting, you know, a week, week or so down the road right now, a total of uh, 492,700 doses available for our allocation plus um, 5,700 doses for the retail pharmacy program, plus whatever the feds match that with, which we believe is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of 14,000 doses. We just haven't gotten confirmation about that yet. Um, we also now are getting some additional predictability from Operation Warp Speed um, of what we should receive a couple of weeks down the road. It's relatively flat um, for the next few weeks, which is what the federal government has told us to expect. Um, but we'll be communicating that to our providers and hopefully give people a little bit more time to prepare, which we've all been excited about. Um, I do want to, uh, unfortunately, it's been a couple of weeks since I've updated you on vaccine loss. Um, I do have some new, um, some new news to share about that. We had a, a couple of sizable losses that I do want to let people know about, and it, it really does pain me to go over this. Um, within the past week or two, we've lost 133 doses. Um, this was at a, a hospital in the Shreveport area um, due to a temperature mismanagement issue and then a miscommunication with Moderna when we discussed, um, when the provider discussed what the proper course was. Additionally, 200 doses were lost in a pharmacy in the Region 4 Lafayette area. I'll tell you, so that brings the total loss for the state up until date of 548 doses, which uh, every, every drop pains me. Um, I can tell you that all of these have been honest uh, error, human error of, of some sort. Um, for each of these that are sizable, we go back and do what's called a root cause analysis and get into about what what could have been done better, what could have prevented that, try and learn from that. We'll be putting out some HANS or health alert notices over the next few days to address some of the, of the temperature issues. Um, and, and, and one of the points of confusion that I'll clear up is um, when doses arrive from our uh, sub-distributor, you know, from our in-state distributor, those are not to be refrozen, and that will be one of the points that will be re-clarified in a HAN coming out. Um, and I'll keep you up to date, you know, as, as those things go on. Again, it's um, it's not a happy thing to talk about vaccine that was lost and could have gone to someone, and that's, that's not lost on anyone. Um, looking forward, I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what we are nervous about is this variant. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hitting us at just a time when we are recovering from this very big spike, the largest spike we've had in the pandemic over Christmas and New Year's. And uh, the nature of this is that our ability to detect the variant uh, pairs in comparison to how widespread it probably is. You know, as a country, we don't do a lot of what's called genomic sequencing. We don't do a lot of sequencing of the actual uh, virus itself. Some other European countries do, do much more of it. So we know that when we do identify cases like this, that it's a tip of the iceberg scenario. There's much more out there, no doubt, than we're able to identify. Um, at this point in time, um, you know, this week we've been able to confirm two additional variant cases. Both of those were in the Region 5, the Greater Lake Charles area. That takes the total confirmed variant. I'm talking about the B117, or otherwise known as the, as the, as the UK variant. Um, total confirmed cases right now in the state is five. We have an additional 20 
that are pending confirmation in the CDC. The CDC is now getting so many of these pending confirmation requests from states that they're not able to keep up with it. And they've indicated to us they might not be sequencing all of these suspected cases. That's a marker for how widespread the variant is becoming in the U.S. So we know, even though I can tell you there's five confirmed and 20 pending confirmation in state, without doubt, there are many, many more variant cases in the state that we just don't know about. And also, don't be mistaken to think that the variant is just in those two areas, regions one and five, where the, both the confirmed and dependent cases are. The reason why that appears that way is one of the ways we can pick up on a suspected variant is one type of PCR testing platform, um, the type made by Thermo Fisher, it's called Attack Path, can spit out a detailed um, report that can be suggestive of the variant. Not every PCR platform, in fact, no other one besides that TAC path one that we use in the States does that, that makes it suspected of the variant. There are big testing operations in Region 5 and Region 1 that use that TAC path, that Thermo Fisher platform. That's why these suspected cases are coming primarily from that. There are other surveillance networks that cover the rest of the state that have not yet picked up a variant. Doesn't mean that it's not there. Doesn't mean that it's not there. We should assume that the variant is, is out and about and circulating in Louisiana. So what does that mean for us? You know, I think you know, the CDC has said, as the governor mentioned, that they expect nationwide, on average, the variant's gonna be the dominant strain by mid-March. Now, when it actually becomes a dominant strain in Louisiana, I don't know. But there's a good likelihood that we will have a second, excuse me, an additional surge or spike before we're able to achieve herd immunity. And I think people need to be prepared for that. This variant is more transmissible. It's, it's possibly more virulent. Um, the UK has certainly found that it's putting more people per capita in hospital than their previous surges did. So that, th this is likely what's gonna come ahead for us. And, and unfortunately, I think it's gonna hit us before we have enough vaccine available to us to administer and achieve herd immunity. It's somewhat disappointing news I think none of us eight months ago would have thought that we would still be having surges at this point in the game and certainly not, not happy about that. I don't think anyone is. But I think it's important to be honest and to know, know what's ahead. One of the aspects of that is doing what we can now to best prepare. During our last surge, the, the Christmas and New Year surge, we were disadvantaged because we did not get our cases low enough in the interim. And so we went into what we knew was gonna be a high transmission air period. We knew that Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's were gonna set us back, and we went into it with a pretty high level of community transmission. That's like taking a pretty large bonfire and then throwing some more gasoline onto it. Um, I think we can do better this time around. We know that this, this variant is gonna to continue to spread. We, we likely are gonna have another surge. We're going in the right direction now. And so we need to gain as many yards as possible before that happens. The more that we can suppress transmission now, the better prepared we'll be to deal with a surge from this variant if and when it comes. And nobody wants to be talking about another thousand deaths over a three week period. The more that we can suppress transmission now, the better we'll be prepared to weather that storm, which is likely headed our way. I'll take a pause there. I'd be happy to answer any questions for any. Sam? Um, can you talk about, uh, so you guys have talked about in the past of when you move to the next group or expand the group, uh, it's when you see slack in appointments. I know you cited the additional doses we're getting, but are you seeing any slack in the uptake? And specifically, do you have any areas of the state where uptake is lower than uh, other areas? It's relatively, it, it, it's relatively even throughout the state. We, we, we keep up with our pharmacy providers, our clinic providers, and our hospital providers fairly regularly. And as of a few weeks ago, we were hearing across the board that um, just very long wait lists and still much, much more demand than supply. And I, I don't mean to suggest that supply and demand have completely leveled out because they haven't, but we have begun over the past week to hear providers say there's some daylight in their waiting list, they're not as busy. And so that was a signal to us, coupled with a couple other things, coupled with what the experts in the country are, are advising, which is to go down to 65. And 
being cognizant of the severe loss of life that we've weathered and, and knowing what it means in terms of mortality prevention to get down to 65 motivated the, the decision to go forward. Yep, yeah. You guys were pulling back, like, I want to say 15,600 doses from the long term care nursing home program. Why are you saying 10,000 doses a day? What, what happened? It's both. It's, it's just split into two parts. So we're taking 10,000 doses from the long term care bank, which was 93,600, and moving them into direct allocation, which means that we disperse it out to the normal network of pharmacies. In addition, we're taking 5,700, I, I had told you 5,006 is actually 5,700, um, 5,700 and move them from the long-term care program into this new retail pharmacy program. So they're both going to enter the state and the reason why that's important for us is because um, the retail pharmacy program doesn't technically start until February 11th. We began supplying these 57 Walmarts this week. We didn't want there to be a gap in services. We wanted them to be able to do continuously. Well, it's, I mean, we are anxiously trying to get to frontline essential workers uh, because we know that the, what, what their job puts them towards. And so that, you know, that's likely going to be the next phase. And when we're able to get there, you know, as the governor said, is an issue of how much vaccine is available to us. And, and I can tell you right now what the state's going to be guaranteed two or three weeks out. It's, it's essentially flat each week, plus what the uptake is of the current eligibility phase. And it'll be the same process. It'll be talking to providers, understanding what the supply demand mismatch is. Nobody is interested in just telling someone they're eligible if it doesn't translate into access to vaccine. That doesn't help anyone. Yeah. Yep. What's your response to folks who are going to other states like Mississippi to get vaccinated if they don't meet the criteria for Louisiana at this time? Look, I mean, I, I think if you look at the numbers, um, we've administered a greater percentage of the vaccine available to us than, than Mississippi has. So I think there's probably more daylight in the vaccine available in Mississippi. I, I can't comment on what, on what their state's policies are. And I, you know, I, I can't, I guess, fault anyone for trying to get vaccinated. I, all I would ask is for people that are getting vaccinated in, in Louisiana, be honest, be a good neighbor, and, and, and don't gain the system. Yep, Sam. Uh, you guys have obviously laid out what tier two is going to look like in terms of the people eligible. Do you feel like that's set in stone or are you still making tweaks and might adjust that by the time it comes around? I don't think anything is set in stone. I mean, ever on this. I think we continue to listen to national experts. We continue to look at data and data continues to come out. Um, so I think, it, I think it's a good idea of where we're headed, but uh, I would never say that we're not going to listen to some new piece of information that might become available. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I, I do um, wish everyone well. And again, we're, while we're moving in the right direction, I think the message really needs to be to families, let's leverage those gains. Let's, let's make the most of those gains so that if, if cases do go up in the future, which they very well might, we're as well prepared to weather that as possible. Thank you. You know, one, one of the reasons why follow-on priorities may change is the ACIP recommendations may change in terms of CDC looking at, at new things, whether it's a variant or something else, and saying, hey, uh, we need to make an adjustment. That's what happened two weeks ago. But also, we could make a change in the next priority group if we have a new vaccine come online and the data around safety and efficacy and so forth suggests that it's better suited for certain people than others. Um, we may have to make an adjustment. And of course, we will have the benefit at that point of an ASIP recommendation uh, that, that is approved by CDC before we ever receive it. And so it underscores what Dr. Cantor just said. None of this is written in stone. Um, and it, it's a novel coronavirus. That means it's new. We learn things every single day. Uh, and then the vaccines are new, and we're learning things every single day. And I did want to point out that no one should believe that the long-term care partnership is going to administer doses slower than they otherwise would have because we took a total of 15,700 
from that partnership this week. We only did that because those were first doses they were going to receive that they were not going to administer this week and we're not going to slow down uh, that program. Uh, so I, I, I wanted to make sure that people understood that. Um, obviously, and I've alluded to this already, uh, this is carnival season. Super Bowl is on Sunday. Um, let's not repeat the problems that we created for ourselves over the holidays. Let's certainly not repeat what happened in Louisiana following Mardi Gras 2020. Um, unfortunately, most people's Super Bowl activities look a lot like a holiday meal where people from multiple households gather in one place indoors for extended periods of time. It's just not safe. Uh, and I'm encouraging people to not do that this year. Um, also encouraging people to find a way, we're creative people in Louisiana, to celebrate Mardi Gras, but to do it differently this year, to do it safer, uh, to, to have due regard for your neighbor, but also for those healthcare professionals, those heroes who've been working so hard uh, since March of last year. So enjoy the creative house floats. Uh, please remember to wear your mask, press, practice social distancing, avoid crowds. Let's protect those who are most vulnerable uh, to this disease. Let's remember outdoors is always safer than indoors. Um, and more than just being general statements about what we should do, I want you to know that I and the public health officials here are very concerned about what we're seeing already relative to the crowds on Bourbon Street and other large gatherings that are taking place elsewhere. Um, quite frankly, it's irresponsible. It's selfish. We're better than that. We need to do better. Um, I have no doubt that will lead to another surge if we don't get it under control very quickly. And the way this variant works, because it is more easily transmissible, something that previously might have had a minor risk of transmission associated with, with it, and now it's gonna have an elevated risk. And we just need to be very, very mindful of that. We need to be more vigilant. If you plan on watching the Super Bowl, um, you know, I'm not that interested because the Saints aren't in it, to be honest with you. But if you, if you happen to be, please do it safely uh, from your home with your immediate household. And if you need to be able to talk to your friends, there are ways to do that now. You can talk real time. You can both be watching the same game in different locations, and you can be speaking and carrying on and having fun. You can have a beer, and they can have a beer. So enjoy Mardi Gras, enjoy the Super Bowl, but let's do it safely. There's not much enjoyment when you find out that someone contracted COVID at one of these gatherings. And then there's even less enjoyment the next time you gather and that individual isn't there because they're either in the hospital or they're dead. And that is not just some theory of things. We lost a thousand people in three weeks in Louisiana because of gatherings and traveling and activities related to the holidays. So with that, I'm gonna take a few questions now. Sam? Governor, some Best expert. Socks, by, by the way. <laughs> These are uh, Kansas Jayhawk basketball socks. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> even worse. <laughs> well, actually, Pelican socks are great, but Kansas Jayhawks. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the, so some experts say that um, the way uh, appointments are structured in Louisiana and elsewhere, you gotta kinda cast a wide net, do a lot of calling and spending a lot of time on the internet, internet, disadvantages folks who don't have the time or resources or maybe internet access to navigate this. What is the state doing to kinda help folks maybe in rural communities or communities where people are working all the time and don't have time to spend you know, trying to schedule an appointment. Yeah, well, first, first of all, contrast it with uh, those states that set up vaccination programs without appointments and it was first come, first served, and you ended up with people waiting 14, 16, 18 hours overnight 
they were elderly in many cases, and they never did get their vaccine because it ran out before they got there. And that frustration uh, and disappointment ended up causing some people uh, to be very negative towards the whole program and it eroded confidence in it. So we're trying to avoid that uh, by making sure that people, when they show up at one of these 408 places in Louisiana next week, that they can actually get a vaccine and that they don't have a long wait. And in order to facilitate them getting an appointment, uh, we've engaged in an awful lot of advertising. Um, we've, we've said it and we're putting it out in a press release again today. You can call 211 and find out which enrolled providers are close to you. You can get their phone numbers, you can get their email addresses and that sort of thing. Uh, that's also available on the website uh, at LDH. Uh, but we're also engaging, uh, and going forward, it's going to be in a much more robust fashion, uh, grassroots uh, organizations uh, in order to, to amplify those efforts uh, and to, to provide that outreach that we need to connect individuals with the information they need to have in order to schedule appointments. And, and while it's frustrating, I will tell you, um, we've been administering the doses as fast as we've been able to receive doses. Our utilization in Louisiana is high. We're one of the leading states. I know Dr. Kanner mentioned that to you earlier. That is not to say that it's perfect. Uh, and I am not satisfied. Uh, Dr. Phillips and Dr. Kanner, nobody is satisfied. We're going to continue to improve this. Um, but, but I will tell you, we are, we are working with all sorts of groups uh, in order to make sure that individuals have access to the information that they need to have an opportunity to schedule an appointment and receive the vaccine when they are in a priority group that is eligible for vaccination. Yes, sir. Are you planning on asking the legislature to allocate more resources to the LWC to help with uh, taking in more people requesting unemployment? Yeah, well, I don't know that we'll allocate more resources uh, to LWC to get more people. Um, and in fact, Secretary Dajwa hasn't made that uh, request to me. She's already transferred internally. I think about 100 people in order to clear the backlog in that 30,000 person backlog that was waiting on uh, ID verification in order to ascertain their eligibility for benefits. That backlog has, has been worked through. Uh, there's still a very high level of activity, people filing claims, claims payments going out. Um, you know, for example, uh, I spoke with Secretary Dejois this morning. In the month of January, we had three times as many claimants and three times as, as much money paid out as we had all of 2019. But she's moving internally people in order to, to process these claims. Uh, the, the real challenge we're having and every other state is having is we have brand new programs created by the federal government that make eligible for unemployment benefits people who were never eligible before. I think I've mentioned this to you all before, but if, if you lost your job, we were able to call an employer and verify that you, you really did work for that employer and you lost your job and you're eligible. Now we have all these self-employed gig workers uh, and trying to determine their eligibility is much harder. Uh, and, and there has been rampant ID theft all across the country. And when someone goes out and steals the identifications, they are then filing for unemployment benefits uh, under that false identity. And so we have to have a way to intercept that and stop that. Uh, we have set safe safeguards in place, but in order to make sure we're only paying those people who are eligible, it slows down the whole process. And that's, that's the, um, obviously not something that, that we like, but we have to do that because once we run out of money, we're out of money. And if you pay fraudulent claims, then those are, those are claims that you're not gonna pay to individuals uh, who are actually eligible. Um, and, and we realize we have work to do. We, we're working to improve um, the, the processing and the, the timely payment of the claims. But I will again remind you that the Louisiana Workforce, Workforce Commission was recognized by the U.S. Department of Labor as being the best in the country in, in the, the timely payment of benefits. Yes, ma'am. So normally around this time, the state uh, is either gearing up to or has already deployed resources to New Orleans to help with Mardi Gras with state, state troopers and the like. Are, is the state lending any sort of public safety support? 
support for you or for Mardi Gras this year? Well, we, we are. Let me answer that, and then we'll get to the second part. So we are, but, but you know, Mardi Gras is not going to look the same in New Orleans like it did previous years. In fact, we shouldn't be having any balls uh, or, or uh, parades. And so we shouldn't have to do that, but we are going to do it. Um, it, it may not look exactly like it has in previous years, um, but there will be additional assistance provided to the city of New Orleans for uh, this Mardi Gras period, specifically to enforce the restrictions that are in place uh, with respect to COVID-19 so that we can try to make sure that we don't have enhanced transmission uh, going forward, um, especially in light of what happened last year, and I've already mentioned that. And so you're going to see an elevated number of personnel from the state police, from the fire marshal's office, and from alcohol and tobacco control. What do you say to tourists who are thinking about or planning to come to Louisiana for Mardi Gras? Well, I want them to make sure that they're aware of what the restrictions are. And I don't want anybody coming to Louisiana who isn't going to abide by them. Know what the mitigation measures are. And, and look, all travel is risky right now. Uh, and there's a good chance that someone travels in and brings the virus. And if they don't, there's a good chance when they go home, they're going to take it home with them. And, and we'll have spread it around while they're while they're in our state. And so we have to be very careful uh, about this. And, and you know, I'm, I'm looking at the reports just like you all are, and hotel bookings are up uh, considerably. Um, obviously, um, one of the things that this pandemic really clamped down on uh, was travel uh, and, and tourism, and that's, that's played havoc here and elsewhere uh, and, and so forth. But we need people to be safe. Uh, and, and you can be safe if you engage in all the restrictions and all the mitigation measures. But if people think they're going to come to Louisiana, um, anywhere, or New Orleans, and then engage in the same kind of activities they would have pre-pandemic, then they are mistaken. Um, and, and quite frankly, um, they are not welcome here to do that. Yes? Obviously, here in Louisiana on the state level, not hosting those mass vaccination sites yet just because of supply. Um, but yesterday and then earlier this week, the feds announcing they, along with FEMA, are working across the country to set up federal mass vac sites starting in California and some other states. Said they're working with other states to get them as well. Has Louisiana had any discussions with the feds or the White House COVID team about a federal mass vac site? Yeah, well, first of all, we work with the federal government every single day, including with FEMA, um, and that's the agency uh, that is largely responsible for the uh, response from the federal government and with whom we work in order to get the resources that, that you are talking about. We are in discussions with them, and, and one of the things we have to figure out is whether those mass vaccination sites come with allocation of doses that, that are beyond what we would otherwise get. Uh, it could, if they do, we're going to take them up on it. And if they don't, then we're not going to uh, do that yet because in order to make a mass vaccination site work, you have to stockpile the vaccine, which means you're not administering it as you receive it. And we're in a race against time right now to get as many people in the priority group vaccinated as possible, uh, as soon as possible, to make sure that, that we are as protected as we can be uh, with especially with respect to this variant that Dr. Kanner talked about. So we are speaking to them every single day. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, I've got more than I can say grace over here in Louisiana, so I don't know what goes into the decision in other states as to whether they're going to have a mass vaccination site with the allocations that they're getting. Uh, I can tell you very few states did the work on the front end that we did uh, so that we have right at 2,000 enrolled providers. Uh, that are cleared by the state and by the CDC to both receive direct shipments of, of uh, doses of vaccine and to administer those. And so it's possible that you have states that don't have those enrolled providers all over the state the way we do in Louisiana. And so they've decided to take whatever share of, of doses that they were going to allocate to a particular geographic area and administer those through a mass vaccination site. And that may be the best plan for them. That is not the best plan for Louisiana currently, but we absolutely are speaking to our federal partners and our, our state partners uh, down to the offices of emergency preparedness. We are rehearsing with the National Guard and others to stand up mass vaccination sites when we're able to do it, 
but it really is going to take an increase in allocation. Uh, one of the things that I am anxiously awaiting, and we don't know when this is going to happen, and, and technically we don't know if it's going to happen, um, but the next vaccine that is likely to be approved is the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine. And it seems to me that that is a candidate for a mass vaccination site uh, because you don't have to have a relationship with the person getting vaccinated uh, so that you can try to get them back 21 days later or 28 days later. Uh, and it is an additional allocation of vaccine that doesn't slow down anything that you're currently doing. Again, don't know when that's going to happen. Really don't know if it's going to happen. But, but if I were a betting person, and I'm not, I'd bet that it's going to happen. Uh, and we don't know the allocation of doses, at least initially, that we'll receive. Um, but, but we are looking at potentially bringing the next vaccine that comes online and that allocation and, and making that available for mass vaccination sites in Louisiana. And, and that ultimately may not be what we do because at the time that that happens, there may be a better way to administer that vaccine. One more question if you got it. I guess I timed that about right. Look, thank you all for continuing to uh, cover this. It is really important that we communicate factually with the people uh, of Louisiana. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, particularly on social media. Uh, and so I, I really uh, do appreciate the work that you all do. Uh, and we will be back here next week. Actually, I don't know if we know when we're going to do uh, the deal next week. Christina, what, what's it look like? Okay, so likely Tuesday we will let you know on Monday, and if we need to get back with you sooner than that, we certainly will. Thank you all and be safe.